Crone Schnabel. I'm the executive director here. And I'd like to introduce Jeff Stoyer for our exciting talk today. Uh, first, I'll say the Ralph Newsom Lecture Series is free thanks to a grant by the Ralph E. Newsom Kickapoo Reforestation Fund through the UW College of Agricultural and Life Sciences and the Friends of the Kickapoo Valley Reserve and supported by Badger Talks. Jeff Stoyer describes himself as a citizen interested in climate change. Uh, he does have an impressive background as a retired water engineer with the U.S. Geological Survey uh, in water resources discipline. He has a Master of Science in Hydraulic Engineering from the UW-Madison and a Bachelor of Science in Ocean Engineering uh, from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. And he has also worked as a hydrologist for the state of Wisconsin. His research interests include toxic contaminant transport in surface waters, urban stormwater <laughs> pollution, yeah. rainfall runoff modeling, uh, hydrology and stream ecology interactions. Um, he took Al Gore's climate reality training in 2021 and <coughs> Due to that, uh, that interest in attending that, he's been um, paying back by giving these informational talks to the public. Um, and he wants to motivate people on how they can get involved to um, influence legislature and um, teaching people what they can do to solve some of these problems. So thank you for yeah, coming. Thank you. Good morning. So uh, this, uh, she said a lot more than I thought she was ever going to say. I was going to tell you just a little bit about myself, you know, that I am a retired water engineer and received the training. But, you know, I'm not an expert, uh, but I'm a concerned citizen. Uh, and I'm also uh, a grandfather for the first time. Uh, That's a picture of Jack, who was born about a year and a half ago. And you'll see Jack a little bit, a little bit later. So I have really two purposes uh, today. One is to pass along uh, the training I had in any of the, the, the grass. I show some grass and any of the stuff. I've, I've got references if you'd, if you'd like to see it. But then I also wanted to learn from you. Um, and uh, I've got, I have some questions at, at the end. Uh, so this is a shot. I think we've all seen it, you know, looking back from Earth during the Apollo program. And, and to me, it just shows how finite and uh, you know beautiful Earth is. So really, three things today. I'm going to talk about you know uh, must we change and then can we change and then will we change? And just a, a touch of a touch of science. Uh, we we receive heat energy from the sun and about 50 percent of it goes back out to space. It's been going on like this for millions of years. 50 percent goes out to space. Um, about 25 percent is absorbed right into the uh, Earth's surface, and about 25% is uh, trapped in our atmosphere, and, and we need that. Uh, we need that, that's been a balance, but what we've been doing, really since World War II, is thickening, increasing the, the carbon in the atmosphere, and we're inc increasing that insulation blanket. And I do have uh, some handouts of these slides in the back um, uh, that, that you can pick up. So we're putting a lot in the atmosphere, um, the amount of um, heat energy that's being trapped in the atmosphere is literally uh, the same as exploding 600,000 nuclear atomic bombs every day. That's how much heat globally we're putting in the atmosphere. And it really is a fairly thin, it's a fairly thin layer. So, you know, this carbon we're putting in the atmosphere, you know, where's it coming from? Well, it's, it's coming from, that was down deep uh, in the earth for many, many years. We're talking about the coal, we're talking about the gas and the diesel we use, and the natural gas. It's been underground for a long time, and now we are bringing it up into the atmosphere. You know, transportation is maybe about 30% of it, but this, you know, we've got coal plants and different uh, processes that use the, the fossil fuels. This graph shows, this is time, so if we're looking at the last 70 years, and this is the amount of uh, fossil fuels that have been used, 
You really see it kick up here after World War II. And those fuels are primarily made up of, you know, a little bit more than a third is coal, a little more than a third is crude oil, a little bit less is, is natural gas. These next two graphs I want to spend a little bit of, of time on. So this is, this is time when we go back 10,000 years. The actual the ice age, last ice age, I think ended about 11,000 years ago. Civilization started here at about six when we started forming villages and all. So that's time. This axis is the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And you can see that it goes up and down. Volcanoes, they emit carbon, so it would go up, get natural oscillation. If we have an increased plant period on Earth, it goes down, plants use CO2. So you see this, this natural oscillation, and then this step up here, where we're, we're kind of moving between, I don't know, 200, uh, we got 270, 280, along there. And then since World War II, we've shot up to about 420. Um, you might wonder, how do we know what the carbon dioxide was back 6,000 years ago? Today, we could measure CO2 in this room as easily you can take your temperature. It's an easy thing to do. Back then, to get at it, and it was actually the agency I work for, the US Geological Survey, we take ice cores down at the poles, and if you go down deep in an ice core, you can get the information that tells you what the CO2 was. And that's, that's where they, they talk about ice core data before 58. I want to blow up this period right here. This, this period right here and where we go, again, we go, we're like 270 and we go up to 420. So, so this, is, this is a little bit of a complicated graph, but it's kind of important. Here's the CO2 we were looking on this path where it went. And this is the axis here, where, and this is before, right after Civil War, right? So right after Civil War, our CO2 in the atmosphere is maybe 280, but in these last years, it's gone up above uh, 400. Does that make sense? The other axis is global temperature, and that, this, this is weather, right? Weather varies from year to year, so a drop globally here rises up. This is weather. Climate is the long term. And you can see the global temperature tracks it pretty well. Here's the temperature scale. So this is 1 degree centigrade or 1.7 Fahrenheit. So to me, and there's copies of those graphs back there, that, that's an important uh, concept. But the other thing is the, 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 the Earth is a complicated system. But it helps me to think about the principle of CO2 being an insulation blanket. So you can, at home, if you take two bottles and you put in one bottle CO2, what we're breathing out, and just air from the room in the other, put a, a thermal a, a temperature probe in each bottle, put a heat lamp on it, the bottle that has the CO2 will heat up faster and stay higher. So, for me, just the concept of this insulation, I think, is useful. So what, what does that mean? Well, if you take the average global temperature from the last um, 140 years, which years were cooler globally? These years were cooler. Which years were warmer? These years were warmer, global surface temperature. As a result of that, you know, I think we're aware of the, the heat wave we had in the Pacific Northwest here uh, two summers ago. And you know, it took its toll with hospitalizations. This is the amount of people that are hospitalized during the heat wave. And the folks that um, you know, are most vulnerable to it are the poor and the homeless, the elderly, you know, young children, pre-existing, agriculture workers, it's felt that if we keep going the way it is, it's going to be difficult to do ag the way we do. Um, so a lot of this heat, though, that's extra heat that's being trapped, goes to the oceans. And if you do the same type of look where this is just after the last 60 years, but you take the average ocean temperature over the last 60 years, which years were cooler? 
which were warmer. A pretty clear pattern. Um, and one of the things about warmer water is they increase hurricane intensity. This was Ida here um, in uh, August of 21. The Gulf of Mexico was seven degrees Fahrenheit warmer uh, than normal. And you know, Ida went up and uh, caused quite a bit of damage. We had uh, over 80 people that were lost. And, and I think we're familiar with these sites. You know, this was devastation in, in Florida from the hurricane and the flooding. I have this shot in here because this was a different hurricane, but it's, a, it's an amusement park in, in New Jersey. Um, and Hurricane Harvey um, dumped you know, five feet of water in Texas. And a, a lot of these areas where the hurricanes affect are where we've got um, refining and, and chemical areas. And that's where we uh, have a lot of damage in um, just the way our system is, we have a lot of uh, low income and minority communities that live in those industrial areas that uh, take a hit with this stuff. It's also overseas, right? This, this is uh, a hurricane in Guatemala that took 50 people. So hurricanes, you know, warmer waters lead to more intense hurricanes and their intensity, they build more rapidly and the warmer air can hold more moisture, so you've got uh, more precipitation coming down. Um, the infrastructure that takes a hit from extreme weather is extensive. I'm not going to go through uh, all of that. I just have one shot of, uh, you know, a uh, roadway in Michigan. But you know, the effects cost us all, you know, through insurance and uh, taxes. And as this temperature in the oceans uh, rise, they evaporate more water to the atmosphere. And this is a little film clip from uh, NOAA uh, that just shows concentrated um, water in the atmosphere. And it results in um, heavy downpours. I, mean, I think the news right now uses atmospheric rivers. They're starting to use that term, right? Um, but you end up with heavy downpours in Arizona and Texas. And, and uh, just a shot of some of the flooding in, in, in Texas and, and in Nashville. And it's overseas also. I mean, this is uh, in Venice, which is low anyway. And there's some amazing uh, floods that are occurring around the world. And it's happening in China also. You know, uh, China and this uh, flood uh, lost over 300 people. Um, some years ago, I was on a temporary assignment for the US Geological Survey when the Red River flooded. And um, we were measuring the cubic feet, cubic feet per second or gallons per minute that were going under and around bridges. And um, uh, I remember being out in the area and seeing this one farm where all you saw was the tip of the barn sticking up. It's, it's just amazing. Uh, uh, this is actually a shot of the Red River um, you know, just between North Dakota and Minnesota, uh, uh, non-flood and then flood conditions. And, you know, farmers, it's, uh, it affects them due to this very intense rainfall. Um, and this is just a shot of uh, 20 billion in damages, a shot in Nebraska. And it's occurring overseas also, right? There were, uh, in India, in, they had, uh, uh, a flood with a monsoon that was a 1900 death. So it's, it's overseas also. With warmer temperatures, they are finding more clusters of tornadoes. I don't know that they're finding more tornadoes. And tornadoes are a difficult thing for um, scientists or mathematicians to um, do the calculations on that small of scale to really understand what's going on. But they are finding that just the association with warmer the warmer temperatures that we, we are seeing over a long period of time seem to be increasing the clusters of tornadoes. But it's, it's not something that's understood well. Um, as as um, the extra heat evaporates more water from the ocean, it also um, pulls it from the land. right? So I think we're aware of the drought we had in western uh, US here two years ago. Um, Lake Mead, the Reservoir behind uh, Hoover Dam was the lowest it was at since it was filled. And this is overseas also. I mean, Brazil had 
three billion dollars of drought damages, and and Europe is finding low groundwater uh, levels uh, due to uh, decreased overall precipitation. Um, another effect with drier land is we end up with more fires, and uh, scientists have studied this uh, for a bit now, and they're finding that for every 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit, you find about an extra 10 percent uh, lightning strikes. Um, they, these lightning strikes cause fires, and if you looked in California, their six largest fires in their history occurred, you know, in one year. Um, hang with me, this stuff is kind of doom and gloom here for a while. Uh, I got another about five more minutes of it, but um, uh, there's, there's real hope. I mean, we, we can solve this. Our, our, uh, our free enterprise system uh, can handle it. We can't dawdle, but stick with me for another five on the gloom and doom, and we'll, we'll uh, uh, have this slide in here because, um, you know, we, we can't accept it as the norm. Here you get folks playing golf with fire in the back. We can't just say, hey, this is, this is normal. We, we need to live with it, you know, and, and it's occurring overseas also. Um, so what we've affected, we've affected, you know, the water cycle. We've affected how much evaporates, you know, since that curve you saw going up since World War II. During that time period, we've affected how much we evaporate from the oceans and the land. And um, I've, I've kind of looked, and I don't go into it here, but um, the uh, climate report and the modeling that went behind it that comes out of the UN, I mean, I've looked at it so much, and they have a pretty good understanding now where they actually model where carbon is being taken up of plants, where it's going from the water, and they, and they turn that into temperature and, and amount of precipitation, that they can do a pretty good job spatially predicting where things are going to be drier in the world, where they're going to be wetter, where they're going to be more intense precipitations. The, the scientists are, are getting it down, and, uh, but just in general, we've affected the water cycle. Some areas are going to have more intense precipitation, some are going to have more precipitation, some are going to be less, but we've affected that cycle. And Department of Defense, you know, they've recognized it that climate will likely lead to, you know, shortages and, and uh, some changing of disease. And refugees. This is a shot of Syrian refugees in Croatia, and I was actually in Croatia that same year, and I, I was on the train, a scene that maybe had about one third of these people, but I just had assumed it was to the political instability in Syria. But it really, uh, a chunk of it was drought conditions. They lost over half their farms um, over, uh, I don't have the period written, uh, 2006, 2010. And closer to home, here in North and Central America, if we keep going the way we're going, uh, they are calculating increased drought in this area. Uh, Honduras is going to be uh, one of the strongest affected, and again, that will be refugee pressure. You know, um, a touch of science. So uh, our globe uh, moves basically temperature from the equator up to the poles, and for a one degree change at the equator, you get a three degree change at the poles. And that sets up our ocean currents and the air currents. And scientists do not have a good handle on when those currents may change if we keep um, applying extra energy to the globe. And I, I, I'll, I'll say one or two more words about that. You may read about tipping points, and these are uh, some different um, physical tipping points on the globe. And a tipping point is Something that happens abruptly. You can kind of think of uh, water freezing, right? It doesn't freeze at 50, doesn't freeze at 40. Get down to 32 and it freezes pretty rapidly. So a tipping point is something that happens over a, a short gradient. And uh, the ocean setup right now, and, and I was down in Miami in the Coast Guard for um, a couple of years, and you know, the Gulf Stream is well known. Here, when we had a uh, search and rescue case, you expect them to drift up this way. And this affects temperatures in Europe and don't have a really good handle at what point um, that pattern may change. Um, a little bit about 
uh, glaciers. Uh, this is a shot of uh, 1935, a Greenland glacier. You can see the tongue down there. And uh, in 2013, it receded back. And this is just a graphic uh, from NASA of the ice mass reduction over the last uh, almost 20 years in Greenland. Um, I have this in because to remind me uh, about um, 10 years ago, I was in Peru, a small mountain village, and the, and the farmers there depended on um, the summer melt of glaciers to irrigate their crops. And then in years past, the glaciers were reestablished. But when I was there, and this is about 10 years ago, they were just, the glacier was just about gone. And they really didn't have another alternative for watering their crops. They didn't have an irrigation system they could fall back on. And, um, I have this shot in here, just, you know, I was nine years in the Coast Guard, and, and uh, two of them were on a buoy tender icebreaker in Sturgeon Bay, and here we're coming back from a, a, a winter, de uh, winter deployment, and, and this is pancake ice there uh, in the bay, and I, I have it in because, um, you know, ice is important at the uh, poles for wildlife and ecology, but also it's just plain beautiful, you know, it's... Um, so a touch more on ice. This is uh, North Pole in, in 84, and you'll see how it has um, reduced size in 2016. And this is, uh, the y-axis here is the aerial extent of it in square kilometers. And you can see it really fluctuated for most of these 1,500 years. But you can really see it, see it take the dive here uh, more recently. And with that, you get some rising seas. And if you take a look at globally, the uh, cities are most at risk as far as assets. You know, New York and Miami are right there. Um, uh, New York has a fair amount of real estate that's in flood zones now. And, and Kiribati is a South Pacific nation that due to rising seas, they've actually had to purchase land uh, to house uh, some of their refugees uh, from another country. And, um, World Health Organization has said climate change is a, is a threat to humanity. And, and uh, Pope Francis has said, you know, the gravest effects of uh, the taxing environment are suffered oftentimes by the people least able to, to handle it, you know. So we've talked somewhat about this with floods, drought, um, heat, how it affects our food supply. Um, and the Lancet, which is a British research journal, they say that uh, the global change is a, is a health threat. And I'm not going to talk about all of these, but I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, air pollution. And um, globally, uh, air particulate, air pollution, air particulate um, affects, well, there were uh, 9 million deaths, actually. Uh, I'm not sure how many years ago that was from uh, air particulate. Oftentimes, in you know, folks in the urban areas and younger people, um, coal plants are a substantial source of uh, source of air particulate, even with the scrubbers. And I want to mention really three things about coal plants: why why they are they're tough. One is they're taking carbon, coal that's been underground for millions of years, and they're burning it and they're putting the carbon up in the atmosphere. That's one thing that's tough. They're releasing particulate with. Is, and the third is, is mercury. There's a mercury in the coal, and they emit mercury. And um, I had a colleague at the USGS for um, uh, a PhD researcher for 30 years. He studied the atmospheric deposition of mercury, source for power, uh, power plants, to Wisconsin lakes, to the oceans. To He did research in the Yukon. Um, so those are the three tough things about coal plants. You get the particulate, even with scrubbers, they take carbon that's down, bring it up, and then the mercury. Um, it's just a slide that the amount in the oceans has increased. And I think all of us know that you know, women of a certain age of childbearing and uh, young children have to watch what you know, fish we eat. Um, so the cost of carbon is high. And, um, and for, for me, it's just not um, something I think is acceptable for us to pass on to the next generation. And again, this stuff is complicated uh, on Earth, but it helps me to think about just the general concept of carbon being an insulation uh, blanket. So, you know, must we change? Yes. 
Can we change it? And this is, this, is the, this is the good news. We have solutions at hand right now. We don't need any, um, we, we don't need any special technology to turn this around, although uh, I have little doubt we're going to continue to, to develop it. But one of the reasons, it was felt up until uh, about two years ago, it was felt that if we uh, stopped emitting CO2 at our current level, for another 30 years, we we're going to get warmer. But uh, a number of researchers have found that if we can cap it where we are now, we can turn it around in as little as three to five years. And that's because they have found that the oceans can sequester a lot more carbon and, and trees, actually. So how, are, how, are we going, how can we do this? And uh, you know, one is wind, right? It was projected in uh, year 2000. Over the next 10 years, we increased capacity by 30 gigawatts. You know, over 20 years, we exceeded that by a factor of 24 times. Um, the cost of wind in the U.S. has really come down in the last 10 years. So we're, uh, the wind energy capacity has increased for us. You know, Germany, as of a couple of years ago, um, wind and electricity were producing over half their uh, electricity. And, and globally, wind could supply electricity for the globe 40 times over, but of course, the wind doesn't always blow. You have to store it. It's, you have to move it, so it's not, it's not simple. Um, another aspect is solar. Uh, 2002, they felt over the next 10 years, uh, they'd grow by one gigawatt per year, and they exceeded that by 17 times, and you add on another 10 years and exceeded by 132 times. So, so solar, you know, the panels have gotten much cheaper. As a result, our capacity in the U.S. is really grown. Um, overseas, you know, Australia, one in five people are using solar um, in Australia. I have this slide and just, and it shows the mixing of solar and agriculture, right? I mean, the upper left there you see sheep grazing. You see panels uh, uh, above a, uh, a shed there and uh, some, some cultivation. And this last one is, is a, in a transportation setting where you see those are panels between the freeway with a bike path uh, in between. Um, the Vatican uh, uses, Vatican is uh, net, net carbon zero right now, but they use panels. After, when we're done here, if you want to talk, uh, Amy and I were able to, uh, this is my wife Amy, uh, put panels on uh, uh, our house and I could talk to you about that. And if you take all of the energy that the Earth needs for a year, we receive that every hour. So we've got a lot of solar coming down. Um, but again, it doesn't always shine. You have to store it. I'll talk about that a little bit. You have to get it to uh, certain locations. Storage capacity. This is how um, storage capacity has grown over the last 10 years. And this is how storage capacity for electricity is anticipated to grow in the next uh, 30 years. So it's really expected to take off. And that's um, uh, improved batteries. Uh, there's some other ways to store that I can touch on a little bit later if you want. This used to be a natural gas power plant. It's now a battery storage place, largest one in the world. Uh, another large one in Texas. Just a little bit about uh, where we're getting electricity now in the U.S. You can see this was coal for the last 50 years, and you can see it kind of peaked at about 2005 or so. Renewables, right now we are producing similar amounts of electricity from renewables versus coal. Um, uh, when I took the training, a couple things really surprised me, and this was one of them. Uh, this is, the shot, this is a shot of the cost of electricity for coal, and it's stayed pretty stable over the last 10 years. Natural gas has gone down. And you hear people, natural gas, you know, it'll be advertised as the clean energy, and compared to coal, that's true because you don't have the particulate, and you don't have the mercury. But you're still taking carbon that's been down there, and you're putting it up. So um, 
The clean is a little bit misleading, but the, the price, price went down. Uh, nuclear went up a little bit for a couple reasons. The price of wind has gone down, and the price of solar has really come down. Um, so that right now, if you're the CEO of, an, of a power company, you need to expand by 20%. It's just brute cheaper to do it with wind and solar than it is with coal or natural gas. It's just cheaper. I'm going to expand this graph back. This is 10 years. I'm going to go back over 100 years just to show how things, the trend, you know, uh, you know uh, solar just really has shot down since 1970. So um, another quote from a CEO was that, the surprise to them was that how dramatically renewables and storage has beat natural gas. They wouldn't have predicted it five years ago. Another uh, CEO said that you know, there's not a coal plant in this country that's economic. Um, and you know, overseas, you know, Vietnam's canceled their coal plants. Uh, they're going solar. Um, and the coal miners didn't bring this on, you know, but they can be retrained. And it'll, it'll be a, a safer way to make a living. If you recall, like the Massey mine uh, disaster took, I think, uh, 29 people back in 2010. Um, the, uh, I have this shot, and just to remind me to speak, mention the Deepwater Horizon, the explosion there, the platform that took uh, 11 deaths. Um, my son was in the Coast Guard then and was deployed down there for a month plus, and him just describing the effort and the mess that was from the three million barrels. So, so, so the renewable way of energy will be safer for humans, and it's going to be safer for our environment. And right now, there are more jobs in solar than in uh, coal mining. China is putting in more solar than any other country. They're still burning coal. But they're putting in more solar, and they're building the transmission lines to make it happen. Um, we in this country, it takes us a little longer sometimes to do things federally, if you think about you know, our interstate system and all. You know, but, uh, but they're moving on, on getting their high voltage lines in. And there are a lot of um, jobs globally uh, in the renewable sector. Another part of the training I hadn't thought about was it, uh, until they pointed it out. I hadn't thought about it before. It's an opportunity for energy opportunities and energy justice for parts of the world that have never had power before. There are areas of the globe, they haven't had a stable government. They haven't had uh, uh, a stable industry to put up power lines. They, they, haven't, they haven't had that. And solar, you don't need that. You put up a panel, and um, uh, I'm just thinking, you know, we put a, a, a panel on, our, on a motorhome we had, and from that panel, I was able to run the water pump, the panel and a marine battery, you know, a water pump, the refrigerator, you know, the computer. So it doesn't take a lot of infrastructure for people to have access to, to power uh, going this route. Um, that was something I had, hadn't thought about. Um, you know, globally, a lot of folks, a lot of companies have committed to go renewable. And this is a list of global companies. You know, auto folks are moving to electric vehicles. Uh, you know, GM has said they're going to uh, phase out the, for passenger vehicles you know, uh, by 2035, another 13 years or so. Volvo, all of their vehicles are going to be um, electric here by 2030. And I, you know, I, here in the States, we shifted from horse transportation to auto transportation. It, it took us about 20 years here in the States. Globally, it was a little bit longer. Um, but we made that change in about 20 years. And just something, I stuck this in here because I ran into it the other day. If you want to just get a really user-friendly um, blurb on electric cars, just do a search on Hertz electrical vehicles. And they, they've got some really cool links as to how you charge vehicles, the charging system. It's just, um, I, mean, I poked around a little bit the other day, and it's, it's, it's pretty slick. Um, you know, Tesla, they're looking at, uh, you know, semis for, um, with longer ranges. So we have an increase of electric cars on the road. And there are some countries that are, um, 
are nailing down their phase out. I mean, Norway in a couple of years is looking to uh, phase out fossil fuel vehicles. So just a couple of additional solutions. Um, one is agriculture is going to be a part of it. And I'm not going to talk much about that. But it's kind of the idea of if you can keep plants on the soil for much of the year, you're really uh, improving a lot of different things, whether that's through rotational grazing or uh, uh, low or no-till farming. Uh, and I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I, it's a substantial way that we can improve things. The agriculture will play a part. And, and just vegetation uh, in, in general, uh, the planting of trees, because they pulled CO2. Um, so conservation tillage is growing in the US. I have this shot in here to mention a couple of things. So this is a steel mill in Sweden that's been operating since the 1600s. They don't use fossil fuels. They use green hydrogen. And so what does that mean? If you take water and you apply electricity, you'll split it into hydrogen and oxygen. And if the electricity that's used to split water into hydrogen and oxygen is from wind or solar, it's not using your fossil fuels. So you can take that hydrogen and you could store it. Or and in this case, they're using it to create the high temperatures they need for steel. So when you hear green hydrogen, I mean, fuel cell cars. You know, there, is, there are some folks that are looking on that avenue in the States, too, of, of using uh, fuel cells, which is, is hydrogen. So, um, if you, I don't have this in the notes, but if you, if you would do a quick search on Project Drawdown, it's a uh, nonprofit that they have put out, uh, they've got uh, uh, PhD researchers, and they've put out uh, almost 100 solutions to drawing our carbon down and turning this around. Another part of the thing I hadn't thought of prior to the training was this. You know, the agricultural changes on Earth. The agricultural revolution took, um, I don't know, I think six, six centuries. And um, the industrial revolution was faster. It was about 80 years, I, I think. Um, the digital has happened a lot faster. That's happened uh, in over two thirds of my lifetime. When I was in college, we were using the slide rule to do calculations. Um, so that's happened fast. And it's felt that the sustainability, um, it can happen fairly quickly. So can we change? Yes. And, and for me, this, this graph, for me, is a really important one. It's just cheaper right now in the US to use it, which is a, a huge thing. So the question is, will we change? And you know, we're back in the, uh, the Paris Agreement. We have numerous um, local governments that have committed to going 100% renewable. Some have achieved it. Um, I think we're all familiar with uh, the, the passing of the Inflation Reduction Act and the, the climate uh, portions it had in it. But we really do need to move along. We don't, we don't have time to waste. And, and uh, so the question is, have we ever done something like this fast? Is there precedent? And you know, back in 1980, AT&T, uh, they were trying to project how many cell phone users we're going to have. And they projected just you know, under a million in 20 years. Well, they missed it by a factor of 120. They were off. The actual figure was 100 million, not 900,000. And they missed it by another factor of 100 right now, because right now they're 10 billion cell phone users. So the question was. You know, why were they so wrong? And it's partially because the cost of cell phones, they, they dropped sharply, similar to solar panels. The quality improved dramatically, similar to solar panels. And the low-income nations with no landline, they didn't have the stable governments for the, for the landlines. They didn't need it. And uh, this shows how the growth went. This was. In developed countries, the last 30 years of cell phone, and this is the undeveloped. And the undeveloped, they just didn't need to have the stable situation to ha that you needed for the old type telephone, you know? And so it's, it's a similar concept, I think, with solar that you don't need to have that complicated infrastructure. So um, 
it's got the potential to move quickly. Um, it's, it's bringing power to areas that, that haven't had it before. Um, a lot of these slides were provided uh, from the training. You know, I've made some of myself. And I made this one, uh, you know, Time Magazine called last year the year which, you know, people and organizations and governments started to come together and they gave some examples. They talk about the car makers. It's uh, to their financial advantage to move electric cars. You know, wind power is common in China and Europe. In U.S., we're starting to get moving with an offshore there. And um, there are some areas that are actually looking at pulling the carbon out and sequestering it back underground. Batteries are really going to change, uh, going to be made out of materials that are not so uh, difficult to get. And scientists have a much better idea now of the whole um, process. Uh, and you know, coal is being uh, is being phased out. So uh, you know, young people you know in the states are are looking for a you know a safer, cleaner future and and overseas. Um, so I'm going to ask really three things uh, today of you. Is one is uh, use your voice. I mean, you know, talk to your neighbors, talk to your family, talk to your friends. It's not always easy, but you know, learn from them and just, just, just talk about it. And then use your vote. And, and I'm not asking you to vote Libertarian or Democratic or Republican, but if you have a primary and you've got three candidates and one of them is talking about trying to uh, recognize, address carbon in the atmosphere, give that some thought. Um, and then your choices. We all can't put solar panels, so we all can't put... Um, Although the Inflation Reduction Act is, is going to make it easier, I think, for some of this as far as insulating our homes. Um, I mean, we all can't right now put panels in car, but we can don't idle your truck if you don't need to idle the truck and insulate uh, your home. Um, because it's, uh, in, in my mind, our, our children's um, life depends on it, our way of life. A shot of uh, my family. Amy's here. I've got three adult uh, offspring, and, and uh, Beth was uh, married there in COVID about two and a half years ago, and uh, they had Jack about a year and a half ago. And so I'm I'm doing this. Uh, I'm I'm going out and doing this uh, for them, uh, but also I'm looking to uh, learn learn from you all. And and one of the questions I have is uh, and. When we do the question and answer, if you're, if you're um, comfortable to ask to let me know then or catch me solo or the handouts have my email on it, if after you talk to your neighbors and you see this, you know, if you don't recognize that we've done something to the atmosphere and we need to do something about it, what is it that would cause you to recognize that? I mean, I, I'm really interested. Would you need to see the oceans rise three feet, or do you need to have the temperatures uh, in central, in Wisconsin, to be 100 for 30 days? What it is that would cause you to recognize we've done something? I, I'm, I'm really interested in that. Um, so um, the other, if, you, if you know of any other um, groups that might be interested in um, hearing about this, please let me know. I mean, I'm, uh, uh, at least for another six months or so, I'm going to try and pay the information forward. So if it's three people or 30 people, it doesn't matter, you know. Um, so anyway, uh, open it up to questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, because right. Because it, uh, you never pay, you're never able to find the mm -hmm. stock ticker for the forever battery. So the question is about the forever battery. And I'm not familiar with that battery, but I tell you what, if you grab a handout and you shoot me an email, I will send you a couple of links. Um, I've spent a little bit of time reading. It's not something I've really delved into, but batteries are really going to change. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, even to the point where I think 
uh, one of the terms, they're looking at silicon you know, uh, from sand. So in other words, the batteries are really, they're really going to change. And I can, you know, if you're interested in learning more about it for investment or curiosity, shoot me an email and I'll give you a couple of links because uh, it's, 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 it's pretty amazing as to, uh, and, and one of these batteries, uh, I'm not sure it's the silicon one, is going to be marketed here in the next one to two years. Yeah, shoot me an email and I'll, I'll get you it. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm always looking for a graph of battery efficiency over time, like the cell, C, solar panel efficiencies and one like that, but I'm not finding anything on battery efficiencies. And my impression is that, you know, batteries have been studied for 150 years. The efficiency of them is not changing as rapidly as, certainly as the cost has dropped. So the cost has dropped, but I'd like to see what the change in the right. of batteries is. And I suspect it's not that not as pronounced as the solar. Right. Cell. Right. So the question was efficiency of batteries, and you also mentioned solar cells. And I'll, I'll mention two things. One is the the panels that we, like we have in our house. I think they're warranted for 25 years, right? And I you know, they I don't think they really know, right? How, but, uh, and the same thing, shoot me an email as far as efficiency of the, of the batteries. Uh, I, I don't know that off the top of my head, how, um, how they're looking at improving or keeping the efficiency of batteries strong. I don't know. I know we, we were able to get an electric car, and I, there's, a, there's a readout on the car as to the battery capacity, right? And we've just had ours for a year, and we're still at 100%. You know, there hasn't been even dropped 1% on ours. But I, I, I don't know. I don't know other than that, but uh, I just say with our own car, we've had it, we put 13,000 miles on it, and we're still at 100% efficiency with the batteries. But, and I know also that they are, you know, I've, recycling, you know, it took, uh, they, are, um, they are really uh, looking, and there's some specifics in, uh, with recycling batteries, you know, that, the, um, so anyway, pick up the handout and I'll, I'll get you a couple of things. Solar panels, as long as the bonds don't break, they're going to, 100 years from now, they'll be still Yeah, they're semiconductors, basically, I think. Yeah. They may be degraded just because of erosion by wind and dust on the surface. But right. They prove that as well. Right. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the, the promoted now of nuclear power is carbon free. Yep. And I think you got to address that the, it's, it, well, a, a, it's a fail, but the second issue which your graph shows is that. Solar and efficiency is much more efficient than nuclear, and putting money in nuclear is, I mean, the nuclear plant today, you know, is, is a modern thing, and they claim they've solved all kinds of problems, but it's still a waste of money to put it when solar and efficiency is much more efficient. Yeah, the question was about nuclear plants, and really a couple things. One is, is you know, this... Uh, you know, as part of, you know, I took that training and, you know, this, you know, I could spend eight hours a day with the amount of info that comes through this organization. And, and you know, part of the organization is, wants to promote nuclear and, and all. And, and I know they're building, you know, the, the, I think Sweden, smaller micro-nuclear plants and all, but I don't think any, uh, we still have the, the spent fuel situation. I mean, I grew up uh, outside of Manitowoc, south of Green Bay, two nuclear plants. And, uh, that fuel is there above ground, you know. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, the, there's different opinions there on nuclear, but you hit it on the head. We have not solved what to do with the spent fuel and all of it. Our problem locally, though, is Genoa is really high on the list because it's an ideal site for a nuclear. Nuclear, okay. And Darylin Power has is headed by a professional nuclear power, so the rush is on to get the media. Okay, didn't, didn't know. That was in, in Genoa? Or Genoa? Genoa. Genoa. Yes, it already has a licensed nuclear waste dump. Okay. And, and if you put another nuke in there, you can use that existing waste dump. So Got it. So it's really high on the list of a desirable place to put a nuclear plant. Got it. So to kind of uh, jump off on what Spark's talking about, um, the utilities have had a very long relationship with their energy, their, their fuel suppliers. Mm -hmm. And so they have a lot of reason not to agree with this. 
-hmm. So even at the national level, the, the um, National Co-op Electric Co-op Association, they don't talk about the IRA, they don't talk about solar really, unless they can own it. And so could you comment on how this information can be framed, can be <laughs> presented to influence those people who need to in be influenced the most, or is that not possible, and right. what to do to work around that? Right. Um, for me personally, as I said, I'm not an expert in this. I don't have a, a, uh, an answer as to how, uh, the question was, um, uh, some of these utilities, because of their supply chain and all, don't want to move, and uh, what's a good way to try and move, convince them to get on board? Um, let me, uh, I'm going to, actually, again, shoot me an email on that. One of the organizations that comes to mind, have you heard of Renew? Energy, the or, renew. Okay, so I don't know if you can uh, f within there they would have guidance as to how to move it. Um, I, I I don't have insight for you. So there's nothing really in your training. No. That, that addresses that issue. Uh, not that I remember. It was two years ago. <laughs> so I, no, no, I. Yeah, you know, I think uh, the question was it's very political, and, and you know, for um, for my so I've I don't know this is maybe the 18th or 20th group I've spoken to in the two years, ranging from uh, you know business associations to library outreach to service groups and all, and um, I think the the science and the uh, physics of it is is becoming to the point where it's it's not uh, political anymore, but the solutions are. I mean, uh, politics is the how we interact, right? And the solutions are going to be uh, political. You know how you address the changes. You know um, of uh, you know you can take it broadly, like a country like Kiribati, who's who's uh, probably didn't put much carbon in the air at all. And yet they have the expenses of doing things. Do they deserve something from the wider pool? You know, th those those kind of questions, how to fix it. Those are that's 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 political, and that's and so internally here in the U.S. we have all kinds of that stuff. You know, uh, so the science behind it, I don't think is, you know, some people may still feel it is, but I think in general, I don't think. Uh, but you know, actually, how we use some of these solutions. It's political. I'd actually like to just talk about that yeah, for please. a bit. Um, you know, like one kind of parallel thing that, that, that in my mind I can see is kind of a parallel, you know, a good example of how this works. Uh, smoking. You know, we've known for you know how long smoking was bad for you, it was bad for your health, it was really, you know, there was a lot of problems with tobacco use. And it wasn't until the early 2000s, before the state of Wisconsin, finally made smoking in public places illegal. And it wasn't because of health. It had nothing to do with, you know, um, you know, the political will. It had to do with what I call critical mass. There were mm -hmm. people who quit smoking, who mm -hmm. were sick of it, who weren't putting up with it anymore. The politicians had no choice but to follow us. And that's when they finally made smoking illegal in public places. And, and think about the, like, the, the tavern industry fought against it. They were going to destroy their business. Instead, they're booming because of it. Right. Um, you know, and I think you know, we're kind of looking at the same, you know, very similar situation here. As more of us get solar panels, as more of us get EVs, as more of us get ourselves off of fossil fuels, you know, we're no longer subsidizing those people by giving them money every month. We're taking away their money and we're doing it ourselves. And as we do that, yeah. the rest of it's going to have to come along. Yeah, and, and I, I, I comment about that, but uh, about how to move the needle. Shoot me an email because I, you know, I actually, uh, um, 
I may have one or two things from the, so shoot me an email. You know, you're, you're mentioning the tobacco com companies is interesting because there are a number of parallels. And one of them um, was put out in the journal Science. And again, if, if you guys want to get more details than this, shoot me an email. But they published an article that um, it was ExxonMobil and um, at least, I think it was ExxonMobil, but their, um, internally they had the calculations that showed the, um, the models, that showed wh what our, uh, the temperature change was gonna be from burning fossil fuels. They had it internally. And uh, they were, they had it even more accurate than the general scientific community had. But it's just come to light relatively recently and this, this peer reviewed uh, science journal article kind of summarizes that. It's extremely interesting. Tobacco industry, I think there were parallels there, right? You know, so um, uh, anyway. Insurance companies are doing uh, a lot of research and trying to uh, combat, well, uh, to study the effects of global warming in uh, areas that they, uh, like in Florida, uh, uh, they, they don't want to pay insurance claims, so they're trying to find out what areas are more susceptible to all the, the damages that global warming caused. Yeah, the, the, the comment was about the insurance industry is needing to get on top of this and, and seeing how it's going to affect there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you an interesting fact about coal that I happen to know because I saw the data working in a coal plant. So oh. if, if you look at do a NASH analysis of coal and you find out what's in the coal, so radioactive isotopes of thorium and uranium at four to 10 parts per million are in that coal. So every million pounds of coal you burn, <laughs> You've now taken four to ten pounds of uranium and thorium out of the ground and spread it all over. Mm -hmm. And that's never talked about. Thank you. Well, I've got a question left. Okay, yeah. So what happens in the case of a, a solar flare, EMP blast, or a terrorist attack on a grid? What happens to electric current then? Right, right. I'm just, uh, I, I can't answer the, the solar flare, and so I'm just talking off the cuff like, any of you guys would be talking right now. But you know, as far as the terrorist attack grid, you know, we are, it's gonna be fairly distributed, right? It's not gonna be like hitting one nuclear plant. We're, we're pretty distributed. And you know, uh, one way of thinking about it, again, this is off the cuff, you know, we're, we're, we would be producing this energy, uh, if you wanna think about just the US or if you wanna even think about aspects of Wisconsin, we're, we're gonna be producing a lot of it locally. You know, we're not pulling it in from a large distance. You know? So um, I'm sure folks are assessing the threat you know, to terrorism at all, but just for me as a lay person, it seems like we're, we're more distributed than, uh, than before. Yeah, you know, that, that's another issue with nuclear plants, is every existing plant's got a bullseye on it, and the yeah. coordinates are Russian missile somewhere. Any new nuclear installation is going to have a bullseye on it one way or another. So that to me is a safety issue that we don't want to have. It. Right. Yeah. Are there, are there any statistics or is there any data on um, how our own larger cities are increasing heat wise? Um, the question was is there data on how our uh, cities are increasing heat wise? And uh, I don't have it at my fingertips, but uh, I would be really surprised if uh, they, they don't have it. I, I, I'm nearly certain the cities have, um, scientists have quantified, well, I, I, I know cities are, are warmer than surrounding, you know, the concrete and all, they're definitely warmer. And I, uh, um, I'm certain that's been quantified and essentially uh, modeled, you know, as to, but, um, yeah. I also chuckled when I saw California under one of your countries that was going to go fully electric. Oh, okay. I think it said California. Uh, uh, did, 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 did it? Did it? it? Did it? Yeah. EVs. And I thought, well, I know California wanted to be its own country at one time. Well, well you know, I don't want to get to, I mean, uh, my, my purpose is not to talk politics here, but that is one aspect of our republic system, right, that states to a certain extent, are allowed to test things out to a certain extent. So, 
the manufacturing of, uh, of uh, uh, concrete cement is, uh, is a big problem with the amount of energy it takes to manufacture cement. Um, uh, and there's supposedly a new kind of production that is going to lower the... There is, actually. And again, if you, if you are interested in that, uh, include that in the email because I uh, have a slide buried in, you know, when you do this training, you end up like 700 slides, you know, and, and, I, and I make some myself. But uh, it is, it's actually we're putting carbon in the concrete yeah. and it's making it stronger. Um, so it's, it's more efficient. So they're, they're, they're pulling carbon out and I don't remember that technique for pulling it out, but they are putting it into the concrete and it's a place that will stabilize it. It's making the concrete stronger. And I've, if you are interested in that, I, uh, I've got that at my, nearly my fingertips. Yes? Do you have any information about seasonal storage? About what? Seasonal storage. Seasonal storage? How you would store like wind or solar, like... Uh, uh, um, well, uh, well, I'll, I'll say, let me throw two things. So the solar panels we have in our house, we are producing right now about what we use. Uh, in, uh, with our, and it's including our car and all. But in the winter, we, we fall really short. You know, like uh, in the winter, we may you know, produce two to 300. In the summer, we're producing 13, 1400, you know. Um, so, uh, so in the summer, we're the extra that our house doesn't use, we're putting out to the grid, and you know, in the winter time, we're pulling off the grid. So we need the. Um, but as far as uh, seasonal storage, uh, I haven't checked into it a, a lot. But you know, I had the slides with the huge battery uh, areas, right? But I think uh, that um, storing hydrogen, I. Th I think is really being thought of because you know you can use in that summer period where you're producing, at least in Wisconsin, a lot of solar. You could be using that to uh, split apart water to produce the hydrogen, and then you could store that hydrogen for uh, a, a good period of time. So that's one technique. I, I don't know how. Um, you know, one, and I haven't researched, but I, certainly one way you could do too is is when you're producing a lot of. Uh, Solar in, in Wisconsin in the summer, you certainly could be using that to raise the elevation of water, right? And then you know, run through a turbine later, too. I don't know how serious that's being thought about. But um, anyway, the, the, the hydrogen, I think, is um, um, going to be part of that storage. Yes, sir. I'm just commenting on that. There's a recent article in, in the New York on a, a village in Finland uses the storage of solar power in the summer to paint a massive uh, silo of sand. Huh. And that sand provides the village with uh, warm for its swimming pool and all the house heat in the village is provided by that mm -hmm. silo of sand. Well, I, I, so yeah, you know, a little bit heard you know, what he says, a, a kind of a unique way to store, you know, heat in that setting. Sand battery. Sand, sand battery, basically an energy. Yep. So what I should have mentioned was, and, and if you are interested in, it really is a, a, quite a site. If you're not familiar with Project Drawdown, it's, um, it's, it's an amazing site. But what I meant, what I should have mentioned is there's not going to be one solution. You know, it's going, it's going to be a whole range of things for different parts of the U.S., for different parts of the world. It's not going to be one thing. It's going to be, but we really, and, and Project Drawdown does a good job of showing, we have the tools right now, you know. We can, and some of those tools uh, are going to take a little bit of time. In other words, for us in this country to put up uh, high voltage systems to, to move electricity from where we really can produce it efficiently, it's going to take a while. Other things, I mean, I've kind of heard it put one way that construction industry is going to be the, f the tip of the spear because we can insulate our homes very quickly. Some of this stuff we can do more quickly than others. But the, the point is that there are going to be uh, many solutions. And if you, um, uh, the Project Drawdown site does a really good job of, of detailing that.